While leisurely walking along the bustling tourist beach, Anthony Dennis became aware of the penetrating gazes directed towards him. Adjacent to him stood a colossal four-metre digital screen, securely mounted on a flatbed truck. As he approached, he noticed that the screen displayed 16 faces accompanied by the caption, some of the most wanted criminals in Spain, help us find them. Suddenly, the image on the screen transitioned, revealing only one face, his own. The words, wanted, se busca, Anthony Michael Dennis, conspiracy to traffic cocaine, were emblazoned beneath his likeness. Anthony Dennis, a 48-year-old man of unremarkable stature, standing at a mere 1.6 metres tall, possessed no distinctive features apart from a small scar adorning the right side of his forehead. In a bustling crowd, he would have easily blended in, but not anymore. Seeking refuge in nearby bars or restaurants would prove futile, as the incriminating image and the message of his status as a fugitive could be transmitted to anyone in possession of a Bluetooth-enabled phone. This mobile screen truck, which traverses popular areas frequented by British holidaymakers such as Benidorm, Malaga and Puerto Banos, forms a crucial part of Operation Captura. This operation is a collaborative effort between the UK's National Crime Agency, NCA, the crime-fighting charity Crime Stoppers, and Spain's Policia Nacional and Guardia Civil. Established in 2006, Captura aims to apprehend British fugitives who typically seek refuge in what the UK tabloid newspapers refer to as the Costa del Crime. You are watching OCG TV. Chapter 1 The Café The Café de Cato in Rotterdam was a well-known spot for international traffickers, operating under the guise of a legitimate business. Managed by two Turkish brothers, the café was open for an impressive 18 hours each day. Access to the establishment was restricted to familiar faces, requiring a buzzer system for entry. Within its walls, criminals and cartel members would convene to negotiate deals and coordinate the purchase and transportation of large quantities of drugs. Unbeknownst to the criminals, Dutch police officers had covertly recorded their meetings at the café. The Turkish brothers and their criminal associates would subsequently remove the drugs with the assistance of corrupt port officials storing the illicit shipments. Situated at the intersection of Darmstrat and Oranje Bomstrat in Rotterdam's Feyenoord district, in close proximity to the Nieuwermaas River that flows through the city, Café de Ketel did not cater to casual beer drinkers. Access to the small bar was restricted to invited guests only, with the front door remaining locked. The establishment was managed by two brothers, Uo and Ufuk Chamdere. According to a confidential informant, they were allegedly involved in smuggling heroin from Turkey into the Netherlands. Surveillance footage captured by Dutch covert police revealed a consistent stream of individuals frequenting Café de Ketel at all hours of the day and night. Conversations overheard on the café's phones were incessant, conducted in a blend of Dutch, Turkish and English languages. Detectives from the DNR informed lead detectives that the Café de Ketel was supposedly owned by a company that supplied scaffolding to ship repair firms, but this was merely a facade. As police perused the transcripts of wiretapped conversations, they couldn't help but smile as the brothers discussed not scaffolding, but rather shipments of girls, Porsches and wine in calls to countries such as Colombia, Brazil and Panama. Suspicion that the Chamdares and their associates were talking in code about drugs was confirmed when Turkish police, not renowned for being cooperative with their Western counterparts, revealed that Uo Chamdare had been sentenced to six years in Turkey for narcotics offences and that they would like him to return to serve his time. Chapter 2 The Shipment On 5th of April 2013, Errol Soyturk extended a warm welcome to his friend Tony at Café de Ketel. Tony, a British gentleman in his 30s, was a regular visitor during this period. Conversations could be overheard as Tony engaged with Uo and Soyturk regarding an upcoming container ship. We have 60, mentioned Ugo Chamdare. Curious, Tony inquired, are we talking about two bags or three bags of 20? Soyturk, responsible for overseeing shipments entering and leaving the port, discussed the trade of Audi and Koenig, 
which would be discreetly concealed within a legitimate cargo container at the port of embarkation and later removed in Rotterdam by corrupt dockers under the employment of the Chamdere brothers. Tony was accompanied at times by another slightly older British man who was also heavily involved in the shipment, which they frequently referred to as Rolex Rainer 7. The National Crime Agency, NCA, had already been informed well in advance that a couple of Britons were heavily involved in what looked like a major smuggling plot. They were listening in to the group's activities thanks to surveillance work conducted by Dutch intelligence. They recognised the British men's accents as being from Essex in the east of England. With footage from Café de Ketel, they managed to identify Tony as Anthony Wilson from the Essex town of Harlow. Aged 36, 1.8 metres tall, muscular, well-built with a skinhead haircut, Wilson had convictions for petty crime. The other man was Anthony Dennis, aged 47 and also from Essex. He had a conviction for money laundering. During his time at the café, Anthony Dennis took charge of the discussions with his extensive knowledge of law enforcement techniques. At one point, he expressed his concern about the possibility of a recording device being present in the café, to which the Chamderes reassured him that it was not possible as they lived upstairs. The group, consisting of Dennis, Wilson, the Chamderes and Soiturk, frequently discussed the box and the bags. It was during one of these conversations that Wilson revealed the traceable container number INKU 6483504, which contained 67 kilos of cocaine with a wholesale price of 32,000 euro per kilo. The shipment was disguised as chopped up rubber tyres bound for a legitimate company in Germany. The conspirators boasted about the profits they would make from the 2.14 million euro worth of cocaine. The shipment was arranged with a dealer in Brazil and container 6483504 had left the port of Pecum on the MSC Cambra, a Panamanian flagship, on March 15th. On the 23rd of March, the shipment arrived at the port of Cristobal in Panama, where it was unloaded and transferred to the CSAV Lankiwe, a ship registered in Liberia. The cargo was now en route to Europe, but container 6483504 had a different destination than Rotterdam. Instead, the CSAV Lankiwe docked in Antwerp on the 29th of April 2013. The next day, Uru Chamdere informed Anthony Dennis that removing the container was proving to be more challenging than anticipated. He explained that their workers couldn't exceed their shift hours to avoid arousing suspicion. Inside Café de Ketel, panic started to rise. It became apparent that the Chamdere's employees were still desperately searching for container 6483504 and hadn't located it yet. The container was scheduled to be transported by road to Essen on the 1st of May. Ufuk Chamdere informed Wilson that today was the final day to intercept the truck carrying the drugs. The conspirators had obtained the bill of loading and knew the truck's destination and identity. They planned to intercept it near the Essen Industrial Estate by posing as rail workers and breaking open the container. However, hijacking the truck proved too complex and Soiturk went to Essen to find it instead. Despite his efforts, the container arrived at the recycling factory and they found holdalls containing cocaine. As a result, Wilson, Dennis and the Chamderes owed their supplier €892,000 and were in deep trouble. One of the Chamdere's partners was even killed over a missing shipment from another transaction. Despite losing a shipment and facing threats of violence and kidnapping from their supplier, Dennis and Anthony Wilson still frequented Café de Ketel. However, their relationship with the Chamdere brothers was not as friendly as before, with Wilson visiting the café at least 30 times between April and August 2013 to discuss new shipments. Dennis kept his distance as a result, while Wilson remained unaware that his conversations were being recorded and transcribed by the NCA in the UK. Chapter 3. The Arrests On the 29th of October, Dutch authorities conducted a raid on Café de Ketel and several locations in Rotterdam, many of which were frequented by Soiturk. They forcefully entered premises by either breaking down front doors or using chainsaws to cut through them. At 146 Eric Kropstraat, a safe house, they discovered one of the suspects, Alpaj Bulbulkaya, who claimed to be a cleaner. 
He stated that a blue coat hanging in the hallway belonged to someone named Bilal, a name that had never been associated with Café de Ketel. Inside one of the coat's pockets, the police found a remote control device. When activated, it revealed a hidden cache of heavy weaponry behind a sliding wall. As a result, 146 Eric Kropstrat became known as the James Bond House. The Dutch detectives were pleased with the arrest of seven individuals, four Turks and three Dutch, along with the seizure of handguns, assault rifles, numerous mobile phones, a cocaine press, money counting machines, and 500,000 euros in cash. Meanwhile, in England, the NCA was conducting raids on the houses of Dennis and Wilson to prevent the destruction of any evidence. During an interview at Harlow Police Station, Anthony Wilson denied knowing the Chamdarais. When shown a photograph of Café de Ketel, he claimed not to remember ever visiting the establishment. He was unable to provide an explanation for his possession of multiple mobile phones. When asked about his frequent visits to Rotterdam, he calmly stated, I support Feyenoord. However, his visits did not align with the home matches of the Rotterdam football team. When the NCA conducted a search on Anthony Dennis's residence, he was not present. His spouse informed them that she had not seen him for more than a year. The authorities discovered that he had either owned or currently owned a property in Spain, which led to his inclusion in Operation Captura. After being apprehended by the police nine months later, Dennis expressed his displeasure, stating that having my face down there on the beach was way over the top. Chris Dyer, who handcuffed him, retorted, it got you back here, didn't it? Dennis was the final piece of the Café de Ketel puzzle. The extensive investigation was a prime example of pan-European police cooperation, with a determined Dutch prosecutor aiming to combat drug gangs that used the ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp to flood Europe with drugs. On the 18th of November 2015, at the Old Bailey, the Central Criminal Court in London, Anthony Dennis was jailed for 13 years, four months, and Anthony Wilson for 12 years. Standing side by side in the dock, the two accomplices did not acknowledge each other or exchange a word. There had been too many spoken in Café de Ketel. In March 2016, at the District Court in Rotterdam, Uul Chamdere was sentenced to eight years, his brother Ufuk to six. Errol Soiturk received four years and Alpaj Bulbukaya, 28 months.